Keep it simple, stupid. That would be my governing philosophy for life. I keep my life relatively simple, free of all these extraneous uh, issues and stuff going on around me so that I have more time to spend doing what I enjoy doing, which in this case is staring at my data. You may have a different philosophy. Now, unbeknownst to me, my philosophy aligns with the philosophy espoused by this character, Diogenes. I didn't know that. I only found that out. I love watching historical documentaries and I saw one about one of my favorite emperors and it turned out <laughs> this guy told him off. Secondly, the reason I like this guy is because not only did he tell him off, he used the same words that my own brother used to tell me all the time when we were young and stupid. I'm going to give you some examples of philosophy and talk about this guy predominantly and how those philosophies can impact life. The Jira Foundation presents this series called Navigating Research. My man Diogenes is from a small Greek city-state on the coast of the Black Sea called Sinope. He and his father were living there. His father was the mint master and was, was accused of dicking around with the currency. In other words, adding copper or, or iron or something into the gold coins, debasing the currency, and they had to get out of Dodge. So they wound up in Athens. Fortunate for Diogenes, he's probably a very smart kid because he was able to, he was able to learn under Socrates. Now, he was a student of Socrates at the same time that Plato was. And Plato was the, uh, the, the teacher of Aristotle, just to give you an idea of all the philosophers in the story. But the upshot of the story is Socrates did not particularly like Plato. Socrates had to commit suicide. Athens voted democracy. They voted that he had to commit suicide by hemlock. And uh, all of uh, Socrates' students were present when he was going to commit this horrible act. Plato was present, so I'm pretty certain Diogenes was present. And they tried to talk Socrates out of this. They were telling him to go away, don't do it. Socrates said, where else would I go, basically? And he believed in democracy, and they voted him to commit suicide, and he committed suicide. Plato, clearly, after that little bit of experience, didn't like, didn't like uh, democracy too much because he didn't think the masses should be allowed to vote because they weren't smart enough, he felt, just the mindset of someone like that. Maybe that's what put Diogenes off. Diogenes, after the death of Socrates, moved to Corinth, and I think so did uh, Plato for that matter. Diogenes believed in living a very simple life, trying to be as close to nature as possible and let nature harden you so that you can understand what it is to be a better citizen. And so basically what it meant was he lived on the street in a ceramic jar. Here they have him depicted in a barrel, but it was a ceramic jar in the streets of Corinth and basically semi-naked. This man became known as the father of cynicism. To be perfectly honest, I knew nothing of Diogenes before I watched a documentary on Alexander the Great, the second person in this image. This image depicts the meeting of Alexander the Great with Diogenes in the city of Corinth after Philip of Macedon with his young prince son, Alexander, had just invaded and, and uh, conquered Greece and were about to conquer the Spartan Empire. But anyways, I had no idea. I didn't care. I didn't give two dams about philosophy and philosophers until I saw the clip talking about the meeting of these two men. Alexander was taught by Aristotle. Alexander was told by Aristotle that if you go to Corinth or something like that, you can meet Plato and Diogenes. They're both there or something like this. So, of course, he sought out these people. And here's a famous picture of him meeting Diogenes who was living in the streets of Corinth and Alexander comes up to him, introduces himself and says, I am Alexander, blah, blah, blah. 
Is there anything I can do for you? And the man lying in his barrel or jar, semi-naked or basically naked, looks up at him and says, can you move to the right? You're in my son. Now, can you imagine telling some person, the prince of Macedon, the people who just conquered your country and the man who goes on to become one of the greatest people in history to get out of your, out of your line of sight for the sun because you're tanning. And the reason why I liked it so much is because my brother Alec used to say the same thing to me when we were tanning in the backyard at home. We would go sit out in the backyard and suntan and we would talk politics. And every time I would like to walk around as I talk and every now and then I'd be standing in front of him and he'd say, you're in my son. And so those are the two reasons why I like Diogenes. And, and this would be on par with Archimedes of Syracuse because when the Romans eventually in, invaded uh, Sicily and they invaded Syracuse itself, the principality of Syracuse, the, the main person to defend the city against the Romans was Archimedes. And he built this laser weapon they claimed that focused the sun, all that kind of stuff. And basically, the soldiers were told to take him alive. Some soldiers came along this old man on a beach drawing circles and they, he wouldn't do what they asked him to do, so they killed him. And then they found out later it was Aristotle, just to give you an idea. And this would be the same, except the difference was Alexander did not kill Diogenes. So my point is I like this guy because my brother used to say the same thing that Diogenes told Alexander the Great. And Alec used to think he was Alexander when he was a kid. He would call himself Alexander the Great. And basically it turns out that Alec in fact was Diogenes. So Alec, you're Diogenes. So I liked it for that. There's other reasons. I mean, there's another time that the man was standing in front of a brothel and he was heckling the, the, the patrons going into the brothel. And he was making comments and people would give him money. He was begging basically, right? And he's, being, he's heckling people walking in. They're giving him money. And then when he had enough money, he goes in himself. And the reason I like that one too is because when I was in grad school at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, I used to get bored. You know, you'd be working, I'd be working 20 hours in my office doing stuff or playing rugby and all sorts of things. And I just want to do something stupid. I would just go down to street corners in Kingston and I would make comments to couples walking by. A married couple to, you know, boyfriend, girl, whatever. Who the hell knows? Who knows what they are? I didn't know. I didn't know them for a bar soap. They'd be walking by and I'd be making comments. Are you really going to go out with that guy? Jesus, what the hell's wrong with you, man? That woman is... And I would make all these crazy comments. And I, I wasn't terrible insulting, but I was insulting. <laughs> okay, and that was my entertainment for the evening. And I would do that until a police officer would come along. Move along, son, move along. And I'd move along and that would go away. So these are the kind of reasons why I kind of like this man. But the other thing that this guy would do is he didn't like Plato and he certainly didn't like Aristotle. He thought Aristotle was bastardizing the teachings of Socrates and Plato. So he didn't like him at all. But he did not like Plato either. And every time Plato gave a uh, lecture to his students or whatever, he would go in there and try to annoy him by eating or heckling. Or... And one time Plato comes upon Diogenes in the streets of Corinth washing his rhubarb, or rhubarb, his, washing his radishes rather, in a fountain. And he says, you know, if, if you were able to carry yourself in, in the royal court, you wouldn't have to wash your own vegetables. And Diogenes piped up immediately and said, if you learn to wash your own vegetables, you wouldn't have to curry favor in the courts. So I kind of like that. He's kind of a guy that sort of did his own thing. And, and most importantly to me anyways, in the longer term, besides what he said to Alexander, because that's just kind of cool, is more importantly that he lived a very simple life and he believed that if you do things simply going forward, it would probably, and try to harden yourself to the elements, because I like the cold and things like this, and I like to sort of test myself all the time, I felt kind of a kinship. And that's kind of why I like this guy who became known as the father of cynicism. I'm not a cynic. I'm a realist. But he's a cynic. There's obviously huge numbers of philosophers and you can see a whole list of them here. Just a quick Google search will find you many. They got their Socrates, Aristotle, Nietzsche, Plato. And you don't see Diogenes immediately on the list, but you have to go down a little bit. So here's Diogenes here. But there can be any number of them, right? You, you choose your poison. You do you. Coaching philosophies are a great way to give you an idea how it will affect your life or how the game is played or whatever. So, and, I, and I'm showing a picture of Babe Ruth here, probably the greatest baseball player of all time. 
I, I'm not a big baseball fan or a big baseball player. I know of him. I've seen his documentaries. But after that, I couldn't tell if he was the best or whatever. But what I do know is most coaches think that there's an ideal player out there for whatever sport you're talking about or whatever position you're talking about. So in ice hockey, if you're a goalie, they have a particular idea what a goalie looks like. And baseball is no different. I played rugby. And I, I started rugby as a raw 16-year-old with no, no idea of the game at all. And they put me on wing, a speed position, not because I was fast, but they wanted to keep me the hell out of the way. Eventually, I moved into flanker, which requires lots of fitness and abilities to tackle, two of which things I could do. When I moved to South Africa, the quality and the skills level that I ran into were much higher than what I was used to. And I, they wouldn't pick me to play flank. I didn't have the skills. I just didn't. So in any sport, I firmly believe you got to be, if you're bigger, faster, stronger, and better, you're always going to get picked over someone else. If I'm doing the hundred meter dash, I want someone that can run fast. I don't care what he looks like. And yet coaches have an idea of what that person looks like, like baseball. I played rugby. So I moved from winger to flank. And then eventually I got to South Africa where they said, Gordon, you know, you don't have the skills but you're bastard strong. So I moved into the front row and ultimately to tight head prop. An infamous tight head prop, Johan LaRue, who played for the Springboks and got suspended from rugby for three years because he bit Sean Fitzpatrick, the All Blacks hooker. He bit his ear. He played for my rugby club. And he said to me, Gordon, he says, Tight head prop is the only position you can go to the gym and get better at. All the others require skills and training. But tight head prop, you go to that gym and get bastard strong. And that's what I did. My claim to fame is, was replacing him when he got tired or injured. But it taught me a lesson in coaching. So it made me realize that I'm not trying to pick, I'm not trying to pick the ideal player. I didn't like that idea because I knew I needed players that had the skills to do the job because I kept getting moved out of positions because I didn't have the right skills. Why am I using Babe Ruth and not a famous rugby player? The answer is simple. Ba I watched a great movie called Moneyball. And in it, they use math and statistics to pick a winning baseball team. And they use that as their philosophy governing who they picked and then who they played. It, it just gives you an example of what it's all about. There was a nice theory, just not working out. How long is Billy Bean gonna last? He's proven himself right out of a job. In their minds, it's threatening the game. It's threatening the way that they do things. Hey, Daddy, do you think you'll lose your job? What? Where'd you hear that? Well, I go on the internet sometimes. Don't go on the internet. Watch TV or talk to people. You're discounting what scouts have done for 150 years? What the hell am I doing? What is happening in Oakland? It defies everything we know about baseball. Just plain crazy. If we win with this team, we'll change the game. This better work. I'm just kidding. This is my supervisor, Victor A. Hughes at Queens University. Uh, he and I got along very well. He was a uh, crotchety old Eng North Englishman. Most people hated him, which is kind of interesting. His philosophy was simple. You start from first principles. That wasn't good for me. I just, I was a random thinker. I just was. I couldn't follow that. You know, I'd do something different. I'd do things my way. And my way was trying to find different ways to observe, to find interesting things. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes the philosophy of your supervisor may not be the philosophy good for you. So sometimes you don't have to listen to them. Choose your philosopher. Mine was Diogenes. Who's yours? The Jira Foundation will produce more videos like this. Please like, share, or subscribe if you enjoyed this video.